Welcome to the Seasons of Stewardship, recorded on Saturday, October 28, 2023. It lasts about an hour and 20 minutes. Okay, let's start with Advent. And we start with Advent because that is the start of the Christian calendar. It's that wonderful season of anticipation and preparation and waiting. Obviously, there's all of the, the, the cultural, American cultural practices around us. We have our own as the church. But in the church, it's this beautiful, wondrous, joyful season of anticipation and preparation as we practice memory of Jesus' first coming and we prepare ourselves for his second coming. And in that waiting and in that preparation and that anticipatory prayer, it's also a season of stewardship. As we go through these various seasons in this webinar, uh, I'm going to take us into each of the seasons, but also make recommendations of how you can teach on stewardship, preach on stewardship, and make invitations for people to share with the church community. And so as we think and, and, and wonder about preaching and stewardship in Advent, the sermons are about waiting faithfully. The teaching and the preaching is about preparing the way. A new year has just begun. It's not the end of the year in Advent for us as brothers and sisters in Christ. It is the beginning. It is the start. And so as the, the world around us, the cultures around us are wrapping things up, in a crescendo, we are just beginning anew and afresh. And it often makes me wonder in churches as we think about what happens in other nonprofits, there's that famous year-end appeal that goes out from universities and hospitals and other nonprofits, parachurch ministries. Will you give at year-end? Will you make that final year-end gift? And one of the reasons people do it is for tax purposes. But that ask is loud and clear and coming to us from multiple directions. And yet in the church, it's not the year-end appeal. It's meant to be the start of the year appeal as we get things going anew, afresh. As we wait for the second coming of Jesus, we don't wait passively. We wait actively. We wait actively with our stewardship. Here's a suggestion if you've never done this before at in December, that time of year when cultures around us are wrapping things up and we're beginning as the church. Instead of asking for a year-end gift, why not ask for that big opening of the year gift? And maybe it's not just an individual gift that we're asking for, but on top of that, we're announcing one big year-end, actually start of the year church gift that we're all going to make together. And the opportunity is to remind the congregants why we exist as a church community, why we are excited to begin another year again as a church, the impact that God is calling us to have on one another's lives and in the lives of the communities around us. Will you give to this big church gift that we're putting together? We faithfully wait with our presence. We faithfully steward our resources with our own presence. I want to share a story with you that I heard about two years ago. AJ, you're familiar with this story. And this, uh, this comes from a congregation in North Carolina, Methodist Brothers and Sisters. Uh, there was a tragic loss in that faith community in the month of December. Very tragic. Affected everyone. There was mourning. There was grief. And it's in December, the time of great joy and anticipation. And obviously, everyone was praying for the family and sending notes to the family to encourage them in the wake of this tragic loss. And as you can imagine, as, as the weeks went by in December, the family was nowhere to be found. They were behind the scenes, as much of us do when we grieve. They're behind the scenes grieving. It's hard to keep showing up. But on Christmas Eve, 
on Christmas Eve, this broken family showed up for worship, for the Christmas Eve service. They showed up to meet with the faithful who kept the lights on. One more time. Thank God that building was up and running. Thank God those lights were on that Christmas Eve night. Thank God that the faithful waited faithfully and kept practicing the presence of God and kept showing up. And because they did, there was somewhere for that broken, hurting family to go to on Christmas Eve night and find hope and encouragement. Isn't that a beautiful image of stewardship? As you think about that, every Sunday, showing up again as the leader, as the pastor, as the shepherd, lay leaders faithfully showing up one more time with your gifts, with your presence, whether you feel like it or not, on the good Sundays and the bad Sundays, because you never know who God might draw in to that time with you. It's a reminder we give with our gifts, and we also give with our presence, our faithful presence continuing to show up. The season of epiphany, we do so much at year end, the seculars terminology of year end with Thanksgiving and, and then we go into Christmas and all of the hustle there. And then epiphany comes. And what I've often found is we don't celebrate epiphany very well. <laughs> And, and, and the reasons are, are obvious. One, we're worn out. We have done so much as a church family in, in the fall and in Christmas season. Pastors are exhausted. They've preached that extra sermon, and it's one of those big, big sermons of the year. And then we get into Epiphany. And the riches of Epiphany are there for us. The rich messages of Epiphany are there for us. The main one being we're invited to cultivate an awareness of Jesus in the world. He has come. And just as kings brought gifts to him and others brought gifts to him throughout his itinerant ministry, we are called to join in that heritage of faith where we too are invited to bring our own awareness of Jesus in the world. And as pastors and church leaders, our calling is through our preaching, our teaching, our shepherding, our visiting to cultivate that awareness of Jesus in the world. Epiphany is a great time to cast vision in the world that Jesus has come and he's coming. It's also a great time to recast vision in the church. Jesus has come and he is coming. And what are we going to do about that? How are we going to respond to this glorious truth? Christ in us, the hope of glory, he has come. What is your vision this year? Pretend that I'm a visitor in your community, your community of 10 congregants or 100, and I show up on a Sunday morning and, Pastor, do you have five minutes? <laughs> do you have five minutes? Can I just talk to you? And I, I throw you the softball in that five-minute talk. And the softball is, tell me your vision. Tell me your vision. I need hope. I need to be a part of something meaningful. I'm searching. What's your vision this year? What is this church all about? Why do you exist? What do you want to do? Two weeks ago, I took my boys, my two oldest, uh, first time they've been on uh, in Cameron Indoor on, on the campus at Duke, and we got to go in and walk on the court. First time they've had that experience, and if uh, some of you have probably done that too, but it's just such a sacred place. Let's just be honest if you've experienced this, and uh, just the trophies and the history, and you go on the court, and you feel it. And you, and you just think about all of these incredible games and athletes that have played on this very space that I'm walking on. I can remember big shots that were made here and there and all the wins. 
And that's what I'm talking about. What is our vision? The church of Jesus Christ is the most sacred community on the earth. These spaces where we gather to worship while Cameron Indoor is special and memorable. It's not even close, not even close to the sacredness of these spaces where we gather as believers. And that's what I'm talking about. Casting that vision. When we left that court that day, did we want to be a part of that tradition at Duke? And, and if someone would have walked up to us and asked us, do you want to get on on this? We would have said, yes, sign us up. <laughs> I want to be a part of that team. It's a winning team. Oh my, do we, do we have something special here as the church of Jesus Christ. This invitation to carry on the ministry of Jesus in the world, this invitation to trust God that no matter what goes down, God is with us and for us and nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. That's our vision. What is your vision? So if we, you, I would ask you that, what would you say to me? And I want to challenge you to be thinking about that in October as we get ready for a new church calendar year, what vision are you going to cast at the end of this year and starting particularly in Epiphany next year? What will be the vision of your congregation? Reminder, vision is the change in the world that you wanna make, your community wants to make. There's a, uh, there's a ministry, that global ministry there Vision statement is one of my favorites. It is to see a healthy church within walking distance of everyone in the world. <laughs> I mean, what, what an incredible vision statement to see a healthy church within walking distance of everyone in the world. And that can't be your community's vision statement. But what is the change in the world you want to make next year? What's the impact that you want to have on people's lives? And cast that vision everywhere. Saturate the, the, the congregation's communications with that vision. Preach on that vision. Put that vision in the bulletin for people who are online and participating. Make sure you're casting that vision with them. Write a letter at the beginning of the year and cast that vision to the congregation. And it's not just for one person to cast. This is the vision of the community. Imagine the community casting that vision with one another, reminding each other of that vision at, at the dinner table, at the book study, in the hospital, that vision everywhere. The change in the world we want to make as the resurrection community of Jesus, the impact we want to have on people's lives. At the start of the year in Epiphany, develop, delegate, and recruit people. Develop, delegate, and recruit people. We are called to equip the saints. That's the definition of church leadership in the New Testament. We're called to equip the saints. No one person is designed in the body of Christ to exhibit all of the gifts, but Jesus himself is head, and he distributes those gifts to the individual parts of our bodies. I've heard it said more than once that the most difficult vocation in the world is that of a pastor. I've seen it up close and personal. And pastors, pastors develop, delegate, and recruit the body, the bride of Christ. People respond to these direct asks to be involved. In my work with churches and church leaders over the last 20 years, I have seen the impact of these personal invitations. One of my favorites is years ago, working with a church community, they wanted to establish a giving ministry team. 
where it's not just the pastor, but it's a small group of others in the congregation who are thinking and praying and discerning of ways that they could challenge the congregation to give throughout the year, the opportunities for doing that. And I was coaching them as this team was building, and then I met with that team for the first meeting that they had. There were five people on that team, four of whom were under the age of 40. So it's a celebration. We've got a younger generation involved. I asked them one question at the end of the meeting. Why in the world did you agree to be on a stewardship ministry team? This was probably not your first choice. <laughs> There's probably a lot of other ministries you'd rather serve in. And yet you agreed to give your sacred time to this team. Why did you say yes? So I asked all five. Let's go around the room one by one. And four of the five gave the same answer. Listen to this. <laughs> because someone took the time to ask us. Because someone took the time to ask us. They were affirming the value of the personal invitation. Someone took the time to describe this calling to us. They met with us for coffee and they, and they invited us. That's almost sacramental if you think about it. <laughs> what happens in a conversation like that is God's grace inhabits that conversation and, and God calls someone into a particular ministry because another brother or sister in Christ met with them and presented that to them. Develop the stewardship benediction for the year. Have you ever developed a stewardship benediction? Think about the services ending on the Little Easter Sunday mornings throughout the year. How do you end that time with benediction? But have you ever created a stewardship Benediction. I want to share with you one of my favorite benedictions. Uh, I did not write this. Um, I've come upon it. I came upon it maybe five years ago. It's not necessarily a stewardship benediction, but when you think about it, it actually is. Because it has everything to do with us bringing our full selves to service in the kingdom of God. And it's by Richard Halverson, a Presbyterian pastor. It's called a Halverson Blessing. And I actually think you'll be blessed to hear this blessing. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being there. Christ lives in you and has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe this and go in the grace and love and power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Be inspired by that. By the way, after this uh, webinar, AJ, I'll be sending you some notes that you can distribute out. I'll include that blessing with that reminder uh, to discern the opportunity to craft a stewardship blessing. One for each season that you repeatedly bless the congregation with at the end of every single service. Now we move into Lent, the season of self-control and growing. Not the season of giving up chocolates <laughs> for the sake of giving up chocolates, but the season, a season of making more room. When Paul writes to the church at Galatia, he writes on the fruits of the Spirit. In contrast to the flesh, the works of the flesh, the works of selfishness and greed that don't bring life into the world, but actually take life away from ourselves and from the world. Paul says to keep in step with the Spirit, not in step with the flesh, but in step with the Spirit. 
Something for us always to be mindful of, generosity and self-control are both fruits of the same spirit. Okay, the power is in the church for both. Generosity and self-control. Throughout the season of Lent, uh, this says as we are mindful of, of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness and the temptations that he faced, that we too, the saints, congregants, are encountering these same temptations in their lives, these same distractions, the flesh that would keep them away from participating in the body of Christ and, and participating in bringing Christ's life to the world. And so we see Jesus making his way from the temptation to the bab to the to the ministry. So it's it's temptation. And then we see this sequence and this movement of Jesus going in his liturgical ministry of proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing the sick, teaching the teachings of the kingdom, making disciples performing exorcisms, what? Bringing life, signs of new life that has come. So he goes into his ministry and his focus is on others, his neighbors. What some would say, they're supposed to be your enemies. Jesus, what in the world are you doing talking to them, going through their town, inviting them to get on this. Lent is the opportunity to think about the other, to learn about the other, to strengthen our ministries in the direction of the other, our neighbors, leaders, pastors. This is your opportunity to help congregants see neighbor again, see the opportunities for ministries with neighbor. This is what our stewardship, our giving at church, a lot of it is for neighbor. It is meant to be for neighbors, for the poor. We see that in Jesus's ministry. We see that in the, in the, in the New Testament church. We are called to care for our neighbors and love our neighbors as ourselves and care for the poor among us and care for the poor outside of our walls. It's also a time to grow together as we practice more self-control and more generosity. Lynn is an excellent time, not just for private reflection, but for community reflection and community development. I've had a couple of uh, communities I've worked with. They've done a stewardship book study during Lent. Let me grab a couple here to make reference to these. Uh, this is an excellent book. It's one that you can do over 40 days, written by a fellow Methodist pastor. It's called Practicing Extravagant Generosity by Robert Schnace, uh, Daily Reflections on the Grace of Giving. It's a small book, not very expensive, but it's one that groups can do together. And, it's, and, and at the end of each very short reading, there are questions for personal and group reflection and also uh, sections for notes. I really like his writing in this book. I recommend this. Again, it's called Practicing Extravagant Generosity. I'll include this in my notes um, after, after the call. Before I go too quickly, I move from uh, Advent. This is another book I highly recommend if you want to do a stewardship book study in the season of Advent by Walter Brueggemann, a Presbyterian Old Testament scholar. It's called Celebrating Abundance, Devotions for Advent. Celebrating Abundance, Devotions for Advent. Two really uh, good resources for you uh, there. In addition to the community gathering and community uh, discussions about stewardship together, educate on the ways the church is helping others. Help them see neighbor, but also educate on uh, this is another one of those moments when you drop money into the plate or when you make an electronic gift, answer that question of where does this go? How is God using this generosity to bless others, 
to grow his church, to bring life, more life into his church. Let's be honest. People have doubts. People have struggles. Is my gift really making a difference? We have the opportunity to say, amen. Yes, it is making a difference. And remind the people of God, when you give into this pot, Jesus is the host at this table. Jesus is the head of this church. You're not as the pastor. The council is not. It is Jesus that is host and head of this whole thing. And when we give to him, he welcomes that. He breaks that. He distributes that. Narrate that to people. Uh, uh, so a story here that I was mindful of preparing is there uh, in, a, in a church on a Sunday morning, pastor was preaching. He was preaching on stewardship. And uh, he gave a few anecdotes on estate planning in his sermon. He, he, he talked about the importance of giving that last gift through your estate plans, through your will, your last will and testament. Are you discerning that? He challenged the congregation. Are you praying about that? Just like any other gift you would make during your lifetime, are you discerning the call on your life for this last commitment and, and what you're to do with it? And uh, the data out there is between, I think it's still between 60 and 70% of households don't have a will. Uh, it's just astounding to me and why it takes time. It's one of those things that takes focus, but it also takes encouragement for someone pointing out, this is the meaning and the value of doing this. So this pastor, he caught a vision for this. Well, I'll point to it. I'll help them focus on it because everything's spiritual. This is spiritual too. Well, here's, here's the rest of the story. So he, he preaches the sermon, he gives these anecdotes. And about a month later, someone who had heard that sermon, I'm assuming it's not a visitor, shared with him as a result of you saying what you said in your sermon that day, we've updated our will. <laughs> I mean, I, look at that. Uh, you know, it, it just reminds us of, and he, what if he had never heard that? From, from, this, from this person that they had updated their will. Uh, he would have never known the impact that had. And obviously there's so much impact you're having through your preaching and faithful teaching and faithful writing. You're never gonna hear about it. You're never gonna hear about the impact. But I can tell you after doing this for more than 20 years and having conversations with members of churches and working with them, they want you to keep preaching. They actually want you to teach more on this subject. They need the encouragement. They need the inspiration. And so don't be afraid of that. Here's a different kind of a story that uh, was on my mind as I was prepping for this. And this happened during Advent at a, at a church. Uh, this was in Virginia. And the, uh, there was a lay person who agreed to share their giving testimony during a Sunday service in Advent was generous enough, bold enough, humble enough, willing enough to share their stewardship story with the congregation. Well, after the service, someone comes up to him and chides him for doing that. Someone who had heard that chides him for doing that. And what they said to him was this, can't you lay off during Christmas season? We, this is a holy season. This is not the season for doing that. When he told me that's what this person said to him, <laughs> you can imagine my emotion that I kept contained. But I thought to myself, talk about an adventure and missing the point. <laughs> the point of Advent is God so loved the world that God gave. <laughs> God gave. And this person is offended that we would share that message on a Sunday morning. This person would, would share their messing about, they, they was upset that another person was sharing their story of how they participated in the work of God of generosity. My point is, and my point to him was, you keep doing that. You keep doing that. 
Advent is the season for doing this. Epiphany is the season for doing this. Lent is the season for doing this. Because we're called every day to carry on the works of Jesus. And Jesus lived a generous life every single day. Calling people to deeper levels of commitment is always right. Because it's so meaningful what we're about as a church community. In the final analysis, you will, run, you will not run the faithful off. Because you invited them to go deeper and to pray one more time and to give one more time. You will not run the faithful off. You will not run the saints off. The saints are in. And they will stay in. And they respond historically over 2,000 years now of church history. Saints have faithfully responded to preaching and teaching and invitations to go deeper. So be encouraged with that and don't be afraid. A last story before I keep us going through the, the calendar is uh, I met a gentleman about a year ago who shared with me his story that he and his wife, a journey they went on. And this is someone who has a lot of means. And so this is, this is the kind of family that they could write a check for half a million dollars. They, they've got that kind of wealth. And so I was just asking them to just share with me their journey, their giving journey and what they've learned along the way and what inspires them to give. And they shared the story that going back about 10 years ago, they had 20 nonprofits in their church. It was a lot in their alma maters they were giving stuff to. And it's just a lot. They had a lot of pots going and they, they really weren't focusing well on any of them. They were just giving. But they, they, they wanted to turn a corner on their generosity path, and they wanted to learn more about their church, and they wanted to learn more about these nonprofits and their alma maters. What's going on? What's the vision? These types of things. So they scheduled interviews with everybody. They went around the horn and contacted these nonprofits and even met with their pastor and they asked one question, the same question of everybody. And as you can imagine, with their alma mater, they had to tweak it just a little bit. The question was this, what's your vision from God for this year? What's your vision from God this year? Just a very simple question. The, 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 those hearing the question can, can obviously respond in the way they want to, but that was their question. And so they went around the horn and they got all the answers and talked with everyone. And at the end of it, and this is what they're sharing with me now about 10 years later, they said, you know, Sean, of all those conversations we had, there were only two of them that you could tell were ready. <laughs> and they were sincere. And they shared their heart and their passion for change and transformation. And the others weren't. And they were astounded by that. And as you can imagine, they've started focusing more of their attention on the two that shared the vision and the excitement and the passion. So a reminder, keep preaching, keep teaching, keep sharing the vision of the kingdom, keep sharing your vision, keep praying with fellow leaders about what God is calling us to be this year and what can we share. Easter doesn't get any better than Easter. <laughs> Uh, the time of celebration and, and proclamation. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Uh, the disciples get to see him again and be encouraged by him again before his ascensions. New miracles are worked. New teachings. A question here for you is how often does your, cell, your congregation celebrate the works of God in your midst? Inviting people to share is important. Inviting people to celebrate together. I'm mindful of the, the story of Jesus, Jesus' healings and his shock and awe that only one returned to give him thanks. Only one of those he had healed in his, that one story returned to give him thanks. Are we returning to give him thanks? Is your congregation returning to give God thanks for the works God is doing in your midst. Gratitude is so important to our faith. Uh, if we are not grateful, if we are not practicing gratitude, we are not practicing the fullness of faith. 
eat a resurrection meal together in Easter season. Gather the saints together. If not one big meal, set up multiple meals where everybody can get in on that. This is a great time for, we might call evangelism, <laughs> for, for telling our neighbors, come and see, come and learn what we're learning. He is risen. What does that mean? Come and find out that someone was raised from the dead. We're celebrating it. He's Lord of all. He's King. Plan that resurrection meal and invite other people to it. Invite gifts during Easter. Oh, wow. We are celebrating the new thing of Christ risen, Christ risen indeed. Invite people to share their gifts to the work of the risen Lord. I'm helping a church right now plan out a capital campaign. And their asking period is going to be right after Easter on purpose. We're doing it right after Easter for them because they believe that is the right time in the church calendar. Do a big ask for this. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We have, we have put our hope in him. We put our trust in him. We put our faith in him. We put our gifts into his work. I've worked with other churches on the same kind of model. And it's such a beautiful thing. To gather the saints together on the heels of the resurrection where we remember our Lord overcoming death. And celebrate that and celebrate what that means for our lives, what we deem ordinary lives, ordinary resources that are now on fire because of the resurrection. Pentecost. Thanks be to God that Jesus made good on his promise <laughs> to send the spirit. What a special time in the church calendar to remember those early chapters in the books of a book of Acts and what we read about and what we read happened in the lives of those early brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, what I'd like to do is take us into the word and read that to you. <laughs> One of my favorite moments in all of scripture. And if I were asked, if you could only do one talk on stewardship and you could focus on one text and all of the word, what would you pick? And this is it. It is so rich. It's in, because it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. So this is from Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to read with you these verses. It says of the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. Devoted. Again, the saints, they're not going anywhere. Devotion is described. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together. The saints aren't going anywhere. They're together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. So the spirit is wiping out need inspiring the church to share with one another. And then going on, I can't resist, day by day as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, celebrating. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, and the spirit has come and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. And the saints are not going anywhere. The saints will come and the saints will go deeper. As we go through the church calendar, be mindful of those saints of old. We have so many legacies that we have inherited in scripture, but also in history. Stories of faithful stewardship. 
that inspire us and awaken us from our dullness and strengthen us in faith and hope. Help your, help your congregants be mindful of those saints and study those saints. Reference those saints in your, in your sermons. Talk about the early church a lot and these, these practices that are our roots. We're not here without these roots, but to go back to these roots and, re and practice these ancient ways. So roots and legacies, who are the saints among you? Meaning your church community, maybe it's 20 years old, maybe it's 100 years old, maybe even 200 years old. That's a lot of history and a lot of saints have been a part of that community. Do you talk about that history? Do you talk about those saints? I've worked with, with communities where the original building burned to the ground. And the legacy is they rebuilt things. <laughs> they didn't quit. Again, the saints didn't go anywhere. They rebuilt. Encourage the practice of legacy making. That faithful pastor who preached that sermon and talked about estate planning. Encourage those kinds of legacy discussions and prayers invite people to make those commitments and it's not just financial commitments it's it's commitments regarding passing on the faith to the next generation you me we becoming part of that church history we now stand on the shoulders of giants we become the shoulders for the next generation. But to do that requires us to remain faithful and to pass this torch on through legacy commitments to others. Should we think we don't have enough time to study Jesus and learn of Jesus and practice stewardship and encourage the practice of stewardship? We still got a whole lot of time left on the church calendar. It's ordinary time. There is still time and space. That's the good news of the ordinary time. There's still time to be a creative. There's still time to equip the saints. There's still time to tell stories. There's still times to recognize the saints of the past, the communion of saints. I want to make up, say a brief word here about stewardship and suffering. And I want to acknowledge that because on any given week, any given month, just like the family I referenced earlier who had a tragic loss in their, in, in their family in the month of December, that was not the right time <clears throat> to go have coffee with that family and ask them to make a stewardship commitment, right? This is the gift of ordinary time. There is still time. There was still time for that family to participate. I want to speak to the subject of dying well <clears throat> and um, dying well personally, uh, just as we model living for Christ, to model dying for Christ, but also how we as faith communities die well. The reality is, we know it, there are church communities that are passing away. There will be church communities that pass away next year and the next year. And one of the struggles for the saints who are part of these small communities, they feel like they're holding on by one thread of grace, is why bother anymore? You know, why? That's a great vision, but we've only got one year left. And I would say that's what ordinary time teaches us is that that one year in the economy of God is a lot of time. There's a lot of good works that can be done. There's a whole lot of praying that can be done. We've got 52 more Sundays left, 52 more little Easter's left. Let's die well. Let's finish this race well. 
encourage your congregants, if you're part of a community that is dying, is passing away, die well. Encourage them in that season to make a legacy, leave a legacy. Take that final lap faithfully. Show up one more time to Sunday morning service, 52 more times to the little Easter. Pray, pray this year. Gratitude, as I said earlier, a lack of gratitude is a lack of full faith. I once even heard someone say they think gratitude and faith are one and the same. An idea for autumn, and we're obviously in that season now when quite a number of communities might have a pledge season where commitment cards are distributed and, and congregants are invited to make their commitments for the upcoming year's budget. Have you ever run a gratitude initiative during that time? There's a question for you, uh, a gratitude initiative, a gratitude campaign, where this is centered in practices of gratitude, practices of giving thanks to God for all that we have, all that God has given us to do and entrusted to us. The, 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 so the activity is, is baked in gratitude and the commitment in that season comes out of, a, a, out of weeks of hearing preaching on gratitude and teaching on gratitude and hearing encouragement to practice gratitude. There's actually a book written on this as well, another recommendation here. It's called A Gratitude Campaign. So this is another good resource, very short. You can get through it quickly, but it actually gives you uh, a, a program, you might call it, a step-by-step, week-by-week plan for executing a gratitude uh, campaign. So that's highly recommended as well. I often get the question, hey, Sean, should, should we still run these fall campaigns? And is that still the right thing to do? Uh, well, and I always say, did the saints of old do it? Uh, do you have a history of doing that? Yes. <laughs> I, I don't have a problem with you continuing to do it. Where the rub comes in is you don't have everybody responding to that. And that's why the year-long stewardship approach is going to be so helpful. There's no reason to throw the whole thing out and start something entirely different. Let's look at this as more like we've got pieces here that we need to put together that creates a year-long stewardship ministry framed by the liturgical calendar. All Saints Day, one of my favorite days in the life of the church, remembering our roots. My mom passed away three years ago. And she is one of my favorite saints. And on All Saints Day, I'm mindful of her. And I'm mindful of the legacy that she passed on to me. I'm mindful of the values that I want to carry on, those spiritual values that I want to carry forward to honor her. If I have an opportunity to make a gift in honor of my mother, I do it. And we all have saints that we admire and we're carrying on their legacies. So here's a thought, here's an idea, if you've never done this. Invite people to make a gift in honor of someone, a saint in their life. This isn't Catholic saint speech, <laughs> it's a speech here. We're Protestants, but, but we, we are surrounded by these communion of saints that have influenced us three, through time. It's part of our root system and our history and we carry on these traditions and the riches of the faith that's been given to us. Invite people to make gifts in honor of these saints. And um, uh, maybe uh, do a creative ask. Maybe it's, it's, it's not just a gift for the church. Maybe it's a gift for the neighbor that you all are trying to accelerate your missions budget. Will you consider making a gift in honor of a saint? your mom, someone in the congregation that's influencing you. Thank God for ordinary time. All right, we're now going to wrap things up. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground in an hour and six minutes. We went through the calendar. I left some other things out. There's no way 
uh, that we can hit everything on that calendar. I do recommend the liturgical year, the book I mentioned earlier. Obviously, we're students of the liturgy, uh, but but get back into that and let that inspire you and, and some of the other feasts and just some wonderful, wonderful opportunities in those practices to discuss stewardship and invite people into more practices of stewardship. But let's just do a quick wrap up, put all this on one page, core takeaways for all of you from what I've shared so far. Here's the summary. We started with Advent. It's the end of the year on the calendar, but it's actually the start of the year for the church. What about a start of the year church? The rest of the world is asking for the last gift of the year. Invite the first gift of the year. It's gifts giving season anyway. People are buying gifts, exchanging gifts. Think about, think about a, uh, a, a first gift of the year to the church community that you invite everyone to participate in. One big gift for the church in that period of time. And yes, amen, it is the season to talk about generosity. <laughs> <laughs> Don't run away from that. It is the whole point of the season in and of itself. The saints will not go anywhere. Epiphany, cast vision. Cast vision. What is your vision? Craft that vision. Invite involvement as you cast that vision. Go meet with people who there's opportunity for them to share more of their time and talent with the community. Invite them to do something. Delegate, recruit, develop, get things going during this time. Lent, as we're getting things going, we grow together through study and discernment. Uh, AJ's ordered the book for everyone. You, you know, you may want to hold off and do that in Lent. You may want to do it sooner. But do something like that, that so that we're not just exercising self-control in private, we're coming together as a body and growing together in this beautiful season of repentance and refocusing ourselves on Jesus and, and, and his ministry and his ways. Easter, we celebrate. We celebrate the works of God in our midst. We thank people for what they're doing, how they're sharing their time and talent with the church. We invite our neighbors, get in on this. Come, free meal. <laughs> I want you to be my guest. Come and see. It's also a great time to launch a generosity initiative like a capital campaign. Pentecost, it's all about the saints and the legacies. Ordinary time, plenty of time. Let's not forget practices of gratitude and returning and giving thanks for the works of God in our midst and pointing to those works, sharing those works with the congregation. You might want to have a practice of once a quarter. You as a pastor, as a leader of this church community, write a gratitude letter, congregation-wide gratitude letter. I'm thankful to God because, and I'm thankful for you because. Get in those kinds of habits, and the church calendar helps us do that. I mentioned this earlier. I wanted to give you just a quick example of a generosity initiative, uh, how I've structured these in the past with congregations. And let me, this, let me asterisk this by saying another question I get, AJ, you probably get a similar question is, uh, what, what's the best time of the year to, to do a capital campaign or a generosity initiative or a legacy thing? And I always say, well, I want to hear what's going on. <laughs> you know, I'm like that doctor that just wants to hear more symptoms and all of this before we figure out the best plan forward for you. So this is just an example of the way that you can do a special generosity initiative, utilize the church calendar, and where this, the crescendo is during Easter time. Uh, so, uh, start start working with church leaders. Church leaders are coming together and thinking about messaging for this campaign. We're putting together key talking point messages. We're also building a small leadership team to help steer this and guide this and make sure this is pushing forward. And all of our key tactics and plans are going to come out of this leadership team. 
And that work with a leadership team would, would need to take place in the latter part of a calendar year. So, uh, thir uh, so uh, November, December, and into January, you kind of do that behind the scenes work to get things ready. Now you start taking this to the congregation of 10 or 100, but you invite them before you ask them to give to this vision, this generosity initiative, you invite them to help put it together. A great book on team building is by Patrick Lencioni. He's written a lot of books. One of them is called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. One of the dysfunctions is when the leader makes all the decisions about where we're going and what we're going to do, and it's not collaborative enough. And so you would be wise anytime the church goes in a different direction, including generosity initiatives, to invite their input, to do a test run of this and take the vision to them. Get them excited about this, but also ask them the important the question of, what do you think? What are we missing here? Invite them into the discernment process as well. Let the help get them to help you build the boat that we're all going to get in and go go forward in uh, together. That way, when you're in that phase where you're extending the invitation for people to give, they're going to be much more likely to respond. Why? Because they took ownership on, of it early on. No surprise here. We helped build this vision. We had an opportunity to participate in, in, in discernment. So Lent is actually a really good time to do that because that's a time where you can come together, reimagine, revision, and work on a future together right before resurrection season, before the new thing happens. And then in Eastertide is when you invite the gifts. You invite the community to start sharing their gifts Will you give to this initiative what God is calling you to do? You have a meal to get it going and, and generate the excitement. Yes, you invite the neighbors. Get in on this. Come and see the new thing our resurrected Lord is doing in our midst. And last thoughts here. Uh, I'm going to wrap up so we've got time for Q&A. Just last thoughts for me. Don't be afraid to invite boldly be bold in asking don't be afraid of that i'm a spinning record already the saints aren't going anywhere they will go deeper they're in love with jesus they're in love with you they will go deeper invite with boldness don't be afraid Stuart, uh a spirituality of fundraising you've never read that one you gotta read it uh it is the best book out there aj correct me if i'm wrong it is the best book out there on why fundraising is spiritual. It's not going to give you tactical information on how to do it, but it is going to get your heart and your mind in a very inspired place. So definitely uh, uh, give that a look if you haven't already. Hey, just a goal for everybody, grow your stewardship ministry team by at least one. Don't, don't take this on by yourself. This, this can be a lot. I, I'm trying to simplify and give you some a few things that you can do, uh, but I've already stated the obvious pastors have the hardest vocation in the world. You're asked to do a million things. Don't try to lead a stewardship ministry by yourself. Get at least one lay leader to help you build this thing and focus on this. Develop a calendar. I've shared some ideas with you in our time today, but just sit down as you're, as you're mapping things out for next year, cast that vision, and then look at uh, these array of events that happen in the liturgical year and, and, and plan some activities around stewardship and some exercises and some asks. Uh, remember the obstacles to generosity. It's greed. It's that scarcity mindset. It's fear and it's doubt. Okay, these are the hindrances to people being more generous. These are the reasons people give faith, vision, prayer, saints, the modeling of the saints. When we see examples of generosity, we are, we are inspired to do it ourselves. And then those invitations, when you invite people directly to give, they're much more likely to give. Uh, remember that leaders need encouragement and equipping too. 
uh, again, after 20 years of doing this, I've sat with so many discouraged church leaders who themselves are doubtful and wondering, do we really have a shot at all this? Is any of this going to make a difference? Is any of this going to work? And your fellow leaders, they're going to need encouragement as well. Recruit testimonies. Uh, I, I shared the story of, of the gentleman who shared his during Advent and got beat up for it. That doesn't happen often, but it did. Keep sharing those testimonies. Keep inviting people to share those testimonies. They make a difference because it's like any other arena in life. If you have someone that shows you how to do something and gives you an example of what that looks like, you, you, you now have a path that you can walk. But until we talk about giving and until we talk about what it actually looks like and the impact that it's having on people's lives, we're keeping it locked up in a closet, you know, this story of, of giving and generosity. Uh, and then lastly, I was in Nicaragua three weeks ago in a remote village in Nicaragua with a church there. Uh, this was my talk I gave to them. And gosh, it's centered on Philippians 1.6. Paul's writing to the church at Philippi, and he, he promises them in his writing that the work Christ has begun in you, he will carry it to completion. God is enough. That's the summary. God is enough. He will carry us all to completion, your faith communities to completion. He will get it out of you, the potential. Our call is to help people focus on God who is more than enough and to remember God along the way and keep putting our trust in God. And with that, AJ, I'm going to hand it back off to you and then open it up for Q and a as we wrap up. Very good. Thanks so much, Sean. And, um, I, one of the things I was struck by is, uh, you know, you referenced that this time of year for a lot of us um, in many of our churches is kind of, you know, stewardship season, commitment season, and how often uh, we try and cram everything that you've covered um, to, you know, to talk about through the course of the year. We try and cram it into four weeks um, in October or November, and there's just such a rich opportunity Um tying in, you know, the, the liturgical year, our worship year, kind of those rhythms um, that we in the church are already in and already embrace. So um, thanks so much for helping us um, think about that. Um, what what questions um, would you all like to raise for Sean? Things that you like to probe a little deeper, things you're curious about um, that maybe he could help answer for us? Sean, I'm Jim Sanders. I'm uh, in North Wilkesboro. Uh, so you said something that caught my ear just cause I'm, my world is full of to-do lists and we're getting ready to send out our, hmm. you know, we, we don't say pledge. We say estimate of giving, right. Our estimate of giving cards, but, the and there've always been those folks who have, uh, historically, uh, turned those in and faithfully sort of attended to them. And then the folks who, um, don't send those in, uh, but still give faithfully and regularly, you know, people have their own reasons for that. And then, you know, people in the, in the, in the middle. And, um, I was recently, uh, maybe I was in a church, you know, we always look at what other churches have out and about. And I saw one of their cards and one of the things on their card was, um, I don't, is essentially, I don't want to turn in an estimate of giving, but I do plan to give faithfully through the year. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering about, about in this modern, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you know more about what's happening kind of across the, the culture and that that's just kind of a thing about not necessarily ditching the campaigns, but that, that to have to think about them a little bit, like you can't build your budget based on just what the campaigns, you know, it's just not that sort of world anymore. How about, can you speak for a minute about how to generously act both and, do you know what I mean? Like to yeah, sure. generously invite people to think about whichever, as opposed to making the folks who intend to give, but don't want to submit a card feeling like they're, how do you, how do you put them also in the first class cabin? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah sure. Think about that yeah. just because uh, that's that, that language. <clears throat> I think is is kind of new for for uh, 
for churches to 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 honor that kind of giving. Yeah, a couple of thoughts come to mind. One is what you just shared. The uh, commitment card itself is is a good opportunity uh, to educate people on and invite people to at least share. We will give throughout the year. We're just not at this time able to make a commitment. And to give that option is something that they can check. And uh, that way uh, you all can, you know, have that list and have that total number of households that have made that commitment. Um, you know, what you want to do here is as much as you can uh, keep the messaging streamlined to everybody. Everybody gets the same message, you know, so you don't have multiple campaigns going on. Okay, because they didn't commit now, we got to do something special for them. I think in addition to what you're already doing with the pledge campaign in the fall and including that as you shared that extra line on there, you can do some creative things such as um, in the pews, um, or this can be an email that goes out, or you could have, uh, this could be during Sunday announcement. Uh, it could be as you make, so think about this, as you make your gifts throughout the year, please remember and you could just highlight a couple of ways that their giving makes an impact. Uh, did you know, I'm making something up off the top of my head here. Did you know that in the last month, last month there have been uh, 3,000 steps in our sanctuary? 3,000 steps were taken, you know? And you're reminding them, if you think about it, the people going in and out of here, that is a lot of activity, a lot of movement in this space, it's being utilized, it's necessary. Even with a small group of people, if you start calculating, imagining steps like that being taken, uh, did you know that we will distribute 500 meals this year to our neighbors? Did you know, and, and uh, you know, just educating people, and it could be something as simple as a, a bookmark, it could be a card you put in the pew on Sundays for online folks. It could be something that pops up during the service. Did you know as you make your gift throughout the year? This is just a way of making connections both with those who made a pledge and those who didn't. Uh, inspiring them to fulfill it, inspiring them to give, reminding them of the impact your, genera your generosity is having. And also that model gives you the chance to teach and write on uh, why generosity is so meaningful for them as a participant in generosity, that uh, this is God's gift to us to be able to be generous. It, we were invited to, to give as God gave, to participate in the works of, of Jesus through our own giving. So I would so in summary, Jim, I would say definitely what you shared about the pledge card. Uh, give people a chance who are not able to make a commitment to at least say, I'm in. I'll give what I can, but then also try to treat them all the same with your messaging. Going so forward. it's not, a, not just people who can't, but it's people who prefer not to. Do you know do you know what I mean? Sure, like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My sense is, is that there's plenty of generous, regular givers who, for whatever reason, just don't want to or prefer not to. So it's not, you know, when, you know, I tend to think about those folks, maybe, you know, that because uh, that's that sort of language I'm trying to stay away from, you know, so I don't say those of you who would like to make an estimate of giving, but feel like you can't, you know, or what, because that's sort of. I don't want to relegate, you know, so to speak. One one little follow up uh, in terms of what you said about sending it to everyone. Since church membership is not the thing that it used to be, people tend to hang around a church a long time before they ever become a member, or they maybe they have cemetery privileges somewhere else and they never <laughs> become, a, you know, never become a memory member. Just because, um, uh, so who ought to be asked? In terms of their, do you know what I'm? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, sure, good like question. Theory, you know, anybody who's given a anything to the just I made a. I tend to think of people who have made an undesignated sort of offering plate gift, uh, on some sort of basis is really those are the folks who've said, "Hey, I like this place. I'm, 
I'm going to make an under, you know, make a, make a gift, but can you, I don't know how, how do you, how do you, how do you decide? Yeah. Well, can I, 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 you know, as I said earlier, I take the approach of to be asked is to be honored. And um, that to extend that honor to someone who is a member on the books, to extend that to someone who isn't a member on the books and has only been showing up for a month, ask them, honor them, honor their faith, honor their attendance by asking them. I mean, what at the end of the day, what is the harm? to that you know there isn't it's honor it's it's invitation to participate in the body and what jesus is doing and you know there's some good language that you can put together around that as well but uh, i'd be really inclusive with that and uh, i wouldn't overthink they've only come twice or you know they've never served <laughs> in one of our ministries i would um i would just extend that invitation would be generous in, in asking all right. Yeah. And to yeah. extend that further, Sean, I mean, you're not asking people for money. You're asking people to invest in the work of the church. You're asking people to make a difference. You're asking people to change lives. Money's part of it, but you're you're not asking for money. You're asking for you know, going back to that vision that you were talking about and and the ways that the church is changing lives. And um, yeah, uh, people are always going to be honored um, that you thought enough of them to uh, to include them in that. Yeah, that's good. I mean, AJ, AJ, that's an excellent point. Now and gets into that in that spirituality of fundraising book and talks through, you know, when you're doing this ask, you are asking them to share their resources with what God is doing in the world. This isn't, uh, hey, I need you to help me grow my kids' college fund. You know, <laughs> this is this is I'm I'm asking on behalf of something bigger than I am that I have the joy of participating in. And I want you to get in on this you know, and be able have the opportunity to participate as well. Great. Other questions for Sean? I do not have a question. I simply want to say thank you. This was uh, extremely informative, and I know that our church folks can uh, look at some of the points that you made and, and discuss how best to uh, keep our stewardship campaign from being just a six-week campaign. Mm -hmm. This was uh, very good. Appreciate it very much. Oh, you're yeah. welcome, Rick. Thank you. Sean, just a, a quick word for, um, you know, a, a lot of our constituency or, you know, maybe in smaller churches and thinking, I don't have... Um, you mentioned bringing other people in on the efforts, but the, you know they don't have a big marketing budget. They can't produce flashy campaign materials and all that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Talk talk to me about the the importance of of those kinds of things versus really the core of what you're asking people to participate in, and you know the importance of materials and mailings and and you know QR codes and all those kinds of things. Oh my gosh, yeah. Oh, uh, I. As I think back, I'm 47. So as I think over back over my 47 years and what's touched me and what's moved me and what's inspired me, it's it's flesh and blood. You know, it's I mentioned my mom earlier, uh, a grandparent, a neighbor that surprises me with something, you know. Um, it's not QR codes, it's not it, it's it it's flesh and blood. It's um you know, Jesus didn't have QR codes and all this stuff when he did, didn't have a car, you know, and uh, had the power of God, had the Holy Spirit. He, um, he took prayer seriously, you know, and so uh, I don't know if I'm getting it, the, the answering your question here, AJ, but it's why I lean so heavily. And in this talk, I, I mentioned, uh, go see people, go recruit people. Um, you may not be able to afford this or that communications model, but you're you're the hands and feet of Christ. The power is already there, promised to you as you as you do the work. Jesus is with you, and so I I just anything you can do personally and uh, gatherings, feasts, meals, potlucks, does all that still in play and relevant? Amen. You bet it is. Uh, so just uh, show up, 
Romans 12, you know, this, this passage about where Paul's wrapping up and he gets into hospitality and other things and challenges, bring your full self, your full flesh and blood, your full spirit, your full soul into the work of the ministry and invite others to do it. And five loaves, two fish, one boy. And out of that comes this massive feeding of people. Um, hi, Sean. This is Jeanette. I'm at um, uh, Ashboro. And I just was really delighted. I took so many notes, and I think it's going to be extremely helpful. Um, so I just wanted to share share that. And uh, I'm looking forward to our, our next meetings and the book. So thank you. Oh, thanks, Jeanette. Maybe next time I, I go to the zoo, I'll come see you. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I feel like if I were um, serving as a pastor, a lay leader at a local church, I feel like you've just given us um, some things to plan uh, for the next year and kind of think about how we can uh, start putting things into play. So Jeanette, sounds like sounds like you're right there as well. So glad to hear that. Good. Well, friends, it is um, just a couple minutes after 1130. And um, again, want to thank you for your time. Um, my office is going to be in touch with you uh, probably on Monday um, to um, get um, make sure we've got a good mailing address for um, some of the resources that Sean mentioned that we would like to send you. Um, that is that is a gift uh, from your foundation um, to you um, to help you take things that you've learned today um, and apply them. Um, but also as you um, are deeply committed to the stewardship journey of your congregation, uh, ways that we can help invest in that. So it's our pleasure to do that. It's our honor to do that. Um, and we're, we're very pleased to be your partner in that. Um, Sean, thanks again so much for your time this morning, for your leadership. Um, grateful for you and, uh, and your ministry. Um, and friends, grateful for all of you uh, on the screen as well. So thanks so much for, for joining us. Hope everyone has a great day. Thank you, AJ. Thank you. Good to see you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.